Hi. Um, um, thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, normally when I come and talk to audiences of doctors and it's, um, it's a weird kind of scenario for a obstetric registrar from North London to do the kind of events that I've done in the last few weeks. Um, but all the, uh, up and down this country I've spoken, I think now, in front of probably about 38, nearly 40,000 individuals at various events. <coughs> and what I've found is that, and I say this today of, of all days, that no doctor I've worked, I've, see, I've met, despite what sometimes they write on, uh, on social media, genuinely wants to do what we're currently, we seem to be heading to doing. I include myself in that. Today would be an easy day to stand here and celebrate uh, something that, you know, that's never really happened in, you know, trade union history. This is not, as Sandeep says, a day to celebrate at all. This is a day to be really, really sorry about what's happened. And sorry is a word that we often get told, um, we, you know, our colleagues in the patient advisor and liaison service who usually say to use the word regret. But I think genuinely today's a day that we're all sorry, isn't it? We're sorry that we've been pushed into this, and we have been pushed into this. Despite what Jeremy Hunt says, I don't have magical powers to convince you anything other than what you can read yourself. And doctors up and down this country have read exactly what is going on. And they've taken it on board, and they've understood exactly what is being proposed to their working lives. I myself have, I have a two-year-old son. I'm uh, married to another doctor. And I wonder what would happen if, I, I'll be out of this contract in a few years' time, but lots of young students that are coming through, the students that I will end up being my junior doctors, will have to go through this. And they will be often married to each other, in relationships with each other, and they have to live their lives with this contract, the contract that he's proposing, or the government's proposing. And I always ask, what happens when you have two doctors working in that contract? What happens to their children? Because I know what choice I would make. I, don't have, I can't find babysitting <coughs> symptoms at 9 o'clock on a Saturday. I can't even find it at 9 o'clock on a Tuesday. The fact is that those two individuals have to make a choice. And when 30 to 35 percent of doctors are actually in relationships or married to other doctors or healthcare staff, those choices are very stark and they're actually quite easy. I don't have to. I don't. I don't even. Wouldn't even think twice. I'd pick my son every time. And that's the situation we're in. We have to be clear that as a profession, as individuals, we are being pushed into making choices that we do not want to make. The other fact of this matter is that it is about patient safety. I keep getting asked this. I work in obstetrics. If I make a mistake, that mistake has consequences. That mistake has consequences on that baby. That mistake has consequences on that family. And that mistake has consequences on me. And those mistakes stay with you. And I've seen that with my colleagues. I've seen that situation where you make the wrong call. And that actually has an impact for a long time and not just on that baby, and not just on that family, but that doctor says, you know what, I can't do this anymore. And we don't want to push people into that situation. And that's what this government is doing. They're pushing more people into that situation. And they're taking away the protections that stop doctors saying, actually, this is not right. This can't, this can't happen. The fact is, I've stood in front of, with um, chief executives of trusts, and I've talked to them about this, managers. If there is a financial penalty that is sitting over them, they make sure those hours stay down. It's a risk on their dashboard when they take it to a trust board. If that risk, if you take away that risk, then who, what does that say? If they're not going to do this to young doctors, why take away the risk? Because the only penalty that's sitting there is that financial one. And if you take that away, if you're saying that the NHS will carry on without that risk, then the fact is that you don't need to take it away because you're taking it away because you know, you believe that actually we are going to go past that line and those doctors are going to be put in that position. 
We all know that. We've worked in the NHS. We understand that no, doc no manager turned up one day and decided to get all the patients through A&E in four hours. They didn't do it out of the kindness of their heart. They did it because there was a financial incentive to make sure that those patients got through. And there are hundreds of examples of that. Because the government knows that every time they want to do something, you put in, an incentive, you put in financial levers to do that. That's how the NHS works. So that when the government is disingenuous and says, this is not about safety, this is about money, and you guys can read every single time that this 11% pay rise that apparently we're getting comes with a nice 20% pay cut. Well, as Sandeep says, I don't think actually anyone, the money is a big issue in the, when it comes to patient safety, because actually we will try and work our way through this. It'll be hard for a lot of people, rent, bills, whatever. But if you're going to end your career because you made the wrong choice, that's a fundamental issue. And frankly, no one is going to make that choice. I don't think. So I would say to every, every doctor today that whilst it's very easy to be elated about what's happened, it's actually the worst thing that we could possibly see. Because actually, 99% of us, 98% of us recognise how ridiculous this situation is. And what we've said to him today was we offered, Heidi said, it was very kind and said that, you know, come and talk to him. We offered him those talks. We said to him, let's have a, const rather than a nice little chat, he keeps inviting me for these nice little chats. It's lovely to go and have a chat with him. Even his letter today, like this week was, you know, dear Johan, it stopped being doc dear Dr. Malawana. Brilliant. Um, <laughs> I feel very privileged to be called by my first name and by, by Secretary of State. But the fact is that actually this is not about a chat. This is not about us being, being nice to me. I frankly don't care. What I want to see is a constructive solution to this problem. And a constructive solution to this problem is a negotiation that actually has a chance of achieving the goal. I've sat there in front of him. And you cannot get a straight answer for this, uh, to this problem because we are not presenting him with essentially a list of un, unfulfillable problems. What we're saying to him is that this is a problem that needs solving. We will help you solve it. These are the doctors that over the next 30 years <coughs> will be the backbone of the NHS. Are they really the doctors that you want to push back into a corner and essentially employ a scorched earth policy with? Are they really the ones you want to alienate? Because every time you need to get a policy through the NHS, these are the very doctors that will deliver that policy, that will go above and beyond, and will make sure those policies are delivered. And what is it you're doing to them? You're pushing them into a, into a corner, back further and further, so they have very little options left. And even when you give him a pass out of it, even when you say to him, look, why don't we have constructive conciliatory talks to try and find a solution? He tweets back, no thank you. <laughs> so, maybe his phone should be taken off him. Um, <laughs> so what can we do? Well, as Heidi says, actually no one wants to get into that situation. I agree with you, Heidi. No one wants to strike action. I don't think there's a doctor in here that absolutely wants to go on strike. But when, the, when we're in the situation we're in, we have to work out that we have got a major problem on our hands. And the only solution to that is a government that unfortunately stops playing politics with us and actually takes this, their responsibility seriously. And frankly, I don't think he takes his responsibility seriously. All he cares about is the politics of this situation and tomorrow's headline and the headline after that and the headline after that. If you were going to submit an 11% pay rise to anyone, you don't do it with a secret press release that no one tells you about the day before, and you certainly, do, you, you know, why on earth would anyone turn down an 11% pay rise? Why on earth does any doctor go on the news and say, no thank you, I don't want that 11% pay rise, thank you very much. And you certainly don't do it in a secret. I mean, the logic of it is just staggering that you would, do, you would, you would actually behave like this. And you behave like this with a group of professionals that frankly, you know, we're the least militant people out there. When I started this job, I genuinely thought that there's like a 1% chance that you could even get to the point where you have a ballot. Because actually, most of the time, the person in my job gets more crap thrown at them than Heidi does. Everyone, yes, knows, the <laughs> everyone knows that the chair of JDC is an easy target, right? 
And yet we see this, right? Because it's not to do with what we've done. It's to do with what's being done to every single one of us. The fact is that this is being done to us and we cannot take it anymore. And we won't. So ultimately, I've said to him that, you know, we are going to see a situation where he might win the war, he might win the battle, he might end up breaking the back of the trade union. He wants to be seen as, you know, in a great Thatcherite sense of being standing up to trade unions, you know, evoking those pictures of those braziers. And he wants to be seen as the great breaker of the <coughs> trade union. Fine. What happens at the end of that? Because these, these individuals, you cannot recreate them overnight. These doctors, once they go, once they go and find something else to do, once they go and find another country to work in, you're not going to get them back. And you're not going to get them back like that. And the fact is, doctors up and down this country are making choices, and it doesn't take 70% of you to walk away. It doesn't even take 10% of you to walk away. It takes less than 2% of us to walk away to create a problem in this country. And that's the issue that he does not seem to get. No matter how much I tell him, it doesn't matter if, I'm, if you're right or wrong. The situation we're in, it's right or the right and wrongs of this. The fact is you, can, you have to stop attacking junior doctors in public. You cannot keep saying, you know, making these stupid statements about 11% pay rises and then attack organisations that frankly are, are actually just saying what our members are telling us. That when you look at this contract, it makes no sense. So, what do we do? Well, so we, today we tried to offer conciliatory talks, and that was thrown in our face. Um, I don't know is the honest answer. I, I am incredibly, incredibly worried about what Jeremy Hunt is pushing us into. He obviously sees this as a blooding moment for the Conservative Party and for him. And that is worrying, that he wishes to use the NHS as a pawn in this game. And I hope, I really hope, that actually this government realises that this is beyond party politics. Because as I go around this country, it's amazing how many of our membership are actually not Labour or Green or Lib Dem supporters. They're the very supporters that elected his party into power. And the fact is, he's losing a lot of support from the very people. My father-in-law was a pilot in the RAF, and they're true blue, true blue Tories. I mean, their son may, their son-in-law may not be their, their ideal son-in-law, but they are true blue Tories, and they have written. You know, I've, I see the letters they wrote, both wrote to George Osborne, their MP, and the crap he wrote back, and the friends all along his, along all along their street, they've written to him as well. Because they, you know, these are the people that are their supporters that absolutely understand that alienating their children, their sons, their daughters, their cousins, their friends, their family, that is not the way forward because these are the people that keep the NHS going. And they're the ones that will keep the patients safe. And unfortunately, this government just does not seem to get it. It just does not seem to get it. Heidi is very lovely and she's, you know, she speaks on, uh, very eloquently about junior doctors. But Heidi is in a minority, I think, of one. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. yeah, they are coming out of the woodwork now. Um, and so, yeah. so I think we need to realise that actually, the other thing I've, I've worked out going around the country is how many doctors, it seems, are related to members of Parliament or the Lords <laughs> or various other people. So I say to doctors, when you come to these meetings, or uh, members of the public, everyone, when you leave here, this is not it. This is not the end of this. Go back and talk to anyone that will listen, any member of the public that will listen to this issue, because actually what we need to do is talk beyond our echo chamber, beyond our number, and can get people to understand what the NHS is currently being threatened with. Because it is an issue for the wider NHS, because these junior doctors are the, essentially the backbone of that NHS. And if you happen to be related to a Tory, uh, MP, talk to them a lot. <laughs> so, um, thank you for inviting me. I'm going to. I'm probably. I'll, I'll probably. Ta I can take some questions, I guess, with your with your panel. And um, thank you for voting. <laughs>